I'd like to introduce anyway um, the next speaker, um, and I, I won't I won't even miss any more words. Michael uh, Tussi, would you like to uh, join the conference? Thank you, Pete. You're welcome. Which microphone do I use? This is what you call it. that I have 
share your story. I encourage you to share your story in detail, sparing no detail, however small. So, what did happen and how can, what can we do about it? Well, my background, I'm going to go into my background. I was, I was raised by a couple of people um, who were depressed. I don't know how I'm going to the makeup, but they were very self involved. We were well fed, well housed. We were treated like slaves. Um, I once got beaten because I couldn't stop laughing. Uh, in Scientology, that's known as a line charge. Yeah. And, but my step, you know, I told a stupid joke about a glass jaw and a glass fist, and it was so funny to me, I started laughing for 30 minutes, and I don't know why I was about 10. And my stepfather pulled out the belt and started beating me because I was not going And similar things for the rest of Mostly it was emotional abuse, some physical abuse. So we did chores, we did big ones, no. So I never wanted to be a slave again. I never wanted to be under the thumb of somebody again. I never wanted somebody to have control over me again. And I stayed into science fiction because there were so many powerful, able, self determined people in. Science fiction. So I really love science fiction. I escaped my universe by going into science fiction and placing myself in that. So when I encountered technology, I didn't have any defenses because the last thing my parents wanted to teach me was about abusers and manipulators and economy. Because I would have spotted them. So there I was, you know. They offered me what I wanted, they offered me to become powerful, they offered me to become never anyone's slave, and then I could be unique and, you know, uber person and homo nobis. And then the term of which is actually in Robert Heinlein's story, Gulf, written in 1941. So, the thing that we need to do first about is to educate our children, and our intention on this is We have to educate our children, all children, about manipulation and confidence games and what they look like and what they feel like. That it's not only the sudden physical attack, but the slow, friendly seduction that can ruin their lives. Give them the defenses. They have to be taught the pretty girl with the personality test is as much a stranger danger as the pedophile with the band and the puppies. Wow. Yeah. 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 It, it's it's gotta be at the same level. And it's gotta start over. So go to control, because the Scientology cover is all about control. Controlling people's minds, controlling their imagination, and giving them something to believe in, making them believe in. And that's all part of Scientology. It's essential control of you and everything in the environment. And the thing that starts it is you giving up your control over yourself. Um, reading again on our next slide that I was just saying, I shared with him um, some insights from my copy of George Estabrook's 1943 book on hypnotism. Uh, back in the days, and we shared some radio shows um, on national radio. Um, hypnosis is about control. Now, what is the exact point that it starts? The exact point that hypnosis starts is when you give up control. It starts much earlier than you expect. The moment you divert your path in life from going to the bookstore and somebody distracts your attention do a personality test or take a stress test that squeeze the hands. They've exerted control of your life and they've changed you from your path. And you didn't even know you gave up that control. You thought it was reasonable. You thought it was, you know, this is just somebody trying to help me. You know, or this is somebody with something interesting. But you gave that control up in an environment where you were not fully involved. There's a string of sign on them that says, I'm a con man, I'm not going to try to con you. Come over and do a 
No, that's all given to you. And you gave up control on the company. And I go to the point where a lot of people make, what do you decide to do? It? Bullshit. You decided to do it based on what you were told and what you could see. But if you've been fully informed that Hubbard was a serial fantasist and, and a bigamist and uh, a carcasset as a war hero, then you would never have gone on that stress test or done that personality test or listen to whoever was trying to sell you a diamond in his book. So, so that point of surrender control occurred to me. You know, I was wandering around trying to get my blood to figure out that I had used. And I just went, oh my god. That first exact moment of contact that you didn't even notice was when you surrendered control of your life to just a small amount. And they built on that. And then it goes to, um, that is hypnosis, and yes, hypnosis is all around us, but that does not make it any less a fraud, and does not make it any less a manipulation and a of your mind. How do you it? So, I went over being fully informed. And, uh, Scientology would not be guilty of hypnotism, but if it stated up front on every road sign of business, and as the beginning of every communication, that they are lying, and they are trying to sell you misrepresented, unscientific mental manipulation that is intended to take your money and consume your life. It should be tattooed on every sign of this forehead. Yeah. Fully informed. So if you're fully informed, you have a freedom to choose. If you're not fully informed, you get done. And that's what makes Scientology and how they're not your fault. Um, so the second thing to do about Scientology is to legislate against it. Um, make them fully informed. Anyone they talk to. Make them put the strings of warnings in every communication, either a tattoo or a sticker on Scientology's forehead. I'm selling you something that is a crock of shit and I want to take your money and your life. That's just, that's, that's just fair. So I've written about the role of uh, kind of distance. And just to eliminate that a little bit, I think that when you're confronted and someone takes a little bit of control of you in a Scientology test, what's happening there is you're being confronted with something that you walk into the bookstore where it's a change, right? You had value and intention that you assigned to go to the bookstore. And that's suddenly you heard, right? So you have to explain that to yourself. You have to decide, why am I allowing myself to be diverted? I'm being diverted. I see myself diverted. Oh, this must be more important than what I was doing before. And so the next thing they tell you, they go, oh, you know, maybe taking walks all the time isn't as important as being a course of your life. Right? And, you know, maybe being in school is as important as, you know, paying for your academy level, uh, getting money. And maybe it's not as important to be educated, have a family, and grow up and raise kids, than it is to save the universe by being in the school. So you can see this pattern. Your own values are devalued. You're convinced to give them less importance and less value because that's how you're solving the conflict. It's only a conflict because they're evenly matched, as they balance and you can't make a decision. So the way you solve the cognitive dissonance is by changing your evaluation of the situation, changing how important one part of that is to you. And the stuff that scientology gives you is designed to make everything else in your life less important than Scientology. If you buy it, that's what you do. That's where you go. That's why it builds up. And that's why you wind up 27 minutes later like I did going, what the fuck out? <laughs> so, you know, and you just find a way. You go, oh, I just wanted to see what this was about. Oh, it's a nice girl. You know, she's smiling. You know, some reason why you're there and why you're not doing what you used to do. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's an important point. It's the change in your life. It's the change in the importance that you give to life that allows you to live with the conflicts that you would have had. 
So, okay, so the next section here is um, cool name drivers and other ads. Okay. So, actually, Jimmy Jones was too cheap. He didn't spend the good stuff. He used the uh, flavor aid, which is a knockoff of Kool So, it's kind of a disservice to Kool Aid, essentially. <laughs> this is not um, So, the 10 types of Cyclone. So, there are two kinds of people who join psychology. Those who understand binary and those who don't. That's a bad technical joke, you know, but you know, I wrote it in the end of the yeah. <laughs> um, But it's, it makes a point. Um, there's no way to generalize about science. There's a whole spectrum of types of people who join psychology. From people who were abused like I was to people who were just interested in that intellectual exercise to whatever fantasy to you know whatever damaging problem the thing that they were trying to solve or just seeking out in their life. There's a whole broad spectrum and everybody has a unique story. So you can't you can't really generalize it. You can find trends. You can find things that seem to apply in various different ways. Um, so some of those themes are to help others. To help themselves, to star in a real life version of the fantasy. Uh, because they are imprinted with accepting abuse. Because of the science fiction. To gain personal power, <coughs> to not be lonely, to control others, to become wealthy, to learn common games from master, to abuse others, to take advantage of a pool of pre qualified marks. To serve man. <coughs> if you remember the old files on that episode. I started in the state because I was suffering from abuse and I loved science fiction. I thought I had found the church of all worlds from Heinlein's famous novel, Stranger and Strange Land. So there's a spectrum of people, and I think we could sort of take a look at it. We can say there are second and third and fourth generation psychologists who sort of are their own wheel because they didn't have a choice. They were sort of given it without making that decision, without that point of giving up control, because they were they needed that chance to get up that control. It was basically taken from them. And they never evaluated that. So not talking about the second, third, and fourth generation, although many of these things apply and they come to those points of view sometime in their life until they go back to psychology to solve some of those issues. So it's a content. So my view on it is um, the content I noticed that he has to filter this pool of potential marks down to those people that he can sell his content. And much of psychology is a filter. You know, it's not that they can convert you into a mark. They just filter all the marks out of the vast population, down to the ones that they can grab and hold on to, and who are susceptible to the changing values and to the ideas that are the selling. And the thing is, you become part of the common. You're not only the victim of the con, you become part of the parcel. You're one who becomes the person who's selling the other person on the street and diverting them from their kind of con. And that's one of the most insidious things, and that's one of the most the hardest, one of the hardest things to come to terms with is your own responsibility for doing that to others. And we have this technology that covers that, all this stuff. You know, there's millions and millions of words that you study as a psychologist and so on, much of a contradiction. And uh, I have this adage that the perfect Scientologist is the one who perfectly imitates Hubbard. He overlays Hubbard's personality and his thoughts, Hubbard's evaluations of life and reality with his own, whatever it might be. That gets supreme, and Hubbard's personality goes over time. So, it's those who can displace their own personality with others in their awakening, narcissism, that really advances them. Right. 
Now, if you look at the characteristics of a malignant narcissist and you read Mr. Miller's wonderful book, which is a great book to read that, you can track covers of malignant narcissism from the first moments in his life. And even the known characteristics that go into creating a malignant narcissist are like a doping family that never says no, which is what I would have. So, you know, take a look at that. Make your own package. Um, so there's another group of fanatics that I'm convinced for us to the very common public Scientologists. The true native state malignant narcissists. These are the folks that are already malignant narcissists who have lied or brain damage or whatever the hell happened to them. But we've all met them. You know, those are the rapacious IAS babies that are willing to take your entire fortune and your grandmother's inheritance and everybody around you are going to make for the rest of your life for IAS status levels and building, you know, the flight building and sailing the flight ship and all the other things that they've been trying to break before. And those guys don't care. They may even know, they may even know that Scientology is completely a con. And they're just using it to make money for themselves and to have a secure environment which to take people for their money. And that's what Scientology is. It's almost a perfect environment where you can rip people off. So I think that there's this, this part of the spectrum of people who try to here. People who recognize it as a con and they all have a base of it. And some of them are there to train themselves to run their own mind, and they leave them that. And so we've got many, many medical examples of people who, you know, learned at the feet of the master cover out of school people and went and started their own group because they wanted 100%. They didn't want just the 10 or 15 percent to bring people into other school. So, and here's the plan. Hubbard turned malignant narcissism into a communicable disease. <laughs> <laughs> the people who succeed in time problems don't have empathy to make that. They're all about me, 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 greed and power and control and adulation. And those people rise to the top because there's no mechanism, there's no feedback within Scientology that stops that. Because otherwise it would stop that. Harvard never wrote that into the canon of Scientology that there's some way to stop somebody who was as grasping the power of love as he was. So that's where you're at. Without any feedback, it's a positive loop and it just stands out of control. So Hubbard's paranoia and narcissism, racism, sexism, and predatory personality saturated Scientology. It's in everything he wrote. He promoted himself as the dawn of the new master race and swindled you into joining him. So, as a psychologist, I thought that. Thankfully, I did not get a bad case. But I did things I'm very ashamed of. And where I can, I apologize to people for what I did. I was never really over to actually rip people off the money. And I was really reluctant to do anything with someone that I thought would be bad for them. But, of course, you know, that they did worse than that program. And I apologize to anybody that suffered because of anything that I did. into that 
that personality bailed up as you've done all the It's crazy, right? You know, those things just come out of you and you don't, you don't even realize you think they come. So the personality probably comes out. Attack! You know? Or he's DPS, he's an SB, you know. He's not gay. All those reasons that you explain why it's okay to go out to somebody, or okay, you know, to drop them from your life. So, when it came to psychology techniques, I got to some points where I was fanatically paranoid, and I was going to break laws and discard friends, and I did those. Discard friends I'd known for many years, with people who I loved, and I just treated them like because I thought it was going to write things in science college. So I stayed in the universe, and you know, they would eventually get picked up, and you know, they would all be thought and rebuilt. You need know, to think about it. And it's part of your, it's part of the way you evaluate the universe is that anything you do in support of psychology is in support of everybody. So it doesn't really matter what you do in the right now. So you can justify anything you do as being post arrival or, you know, where they're just a person in the body, and the body dies, they go on and come back, and we will handle them then. There's another part of that which is, uh, there's another part of that which I suffered for many years under uh, that idea that, you know, I could always end this one and come back and start again. I thought of it as taking my ball and going home. You know, I'm not going to play this game anymore. I'm hurt, it's over, I can't work anymore. So, you know, I'm just going to check out and do the next thing. So, psychology requires literal interpretation of its scripture. And I think you might think that some religious groups are fanatic because they have you know, this well developed dialogue and narrative of what their religion, what their teachings mean. And Howard has that too, but. However, you know, KSW, he keeps saying about the work, insists that all of Hubbard's work, you know, be unaltered, and that they are the road out, and there's no other road out, and it can't be changed, and it can't be made into something else, it has to stay that way. So it's a, that's a very powerful thing. It's not something that at least I personally have seen much in other religions, because other religions have, in many cases, a history of interpretation. A history of dialogue, a history of debate, to refine, come to terms with maybe the lessons and how we apply them out, not a literal word for word is what it means, and not, you know, you're an SP and you can go wherever you're going to go. So, given that, I think it contains the seeds, Scientology and other teachings, contains the seeds of the most virulent fundamentalist terrorist religious group this planet has ever seen. Keep on it. Carry that some fanaticism down the road a few hundred years. The Taliban would be my early. Alright? And do we really want to have some hundreds of years in the future after some world catastrophe for some enterprising Joseph Smith to be big enough stainless steel towers and starting up again with no internet? to come to the rescue. Do we really want that? Do we really want this toxic crap covered up sitting around anywhere for someone to give it a rebuttal? So we covered I had some things that I shared about Tony Ortega and I was thinking about my seconds. And if you're familiar with Scientology and monitoring, you go backtrack, you go back into not only your dislike history, but you go back 10 years, 20 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, a million years, 2 million years, into things that supposedly you did that created an impact on you that leave you in this poor condition, you know, living in a body, thinking in your body, walking around on a very great planet. And so it was those things you've done throughout the eternity until now that leave you in that condition. You have to explore them and then recover them and take responsibility for them. And that's the creation. Okay, so think about that. I mean, I personally, you know, had almost kind of like 
the creator of the MT3 content episode on our track that I ran in that period. Um, being things like a, a serial murderer or a pedophile creature. You know, these were things that I invented in auditing to explain why I was so bad. To explain how I had arrived at this point in my life and, and why that was so what it could do was, you know, go through those things and get a floating needle and have a realization about it. And then it could all be gone. But my realization is something was, it's not that. When you relive those instances, when you go through those instances time after time after time in my day, and you relive those instances, you feel those emotions and you feel that anger and those evil purposes and you're trying to destroy that plan and you really, really run that incident and really get yourself in that incident in order to make sure you get all the good out of it. You are traumatizing yourself. It's as much trauma as someone in Vietnam in a firefight huddling, you know, under the nearest little hill so he doesn't get shot in the freezing cold, you know, for 48 hours before somebody rescues him. That's the kind of trauma that someone experiences in real life. Well, all psychologists have gone through this over and with old and FPRD go back and find him but a million year ago, evil purpose that you had and started going, you've given yourself PTSD. And my understanding, I'm not going to use the word combination, my understanding was that that's why I had PTSD. That's why I had that. Because I took responsibility and relived all those imaginary terrible things that I did in order to clear myself. Get it through some time. So, that's where my PTSD comes from. So, my last little part here is uh, recovery from Scientology is hard until I realize I <laughs> suffered through more of that and more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It makes you look free. And you never tell anybody about it because you can't share. You can never talk with anybody about it and come to grips with that as not really to do. So what do we do? What do we do about Scientology? I say we enter into Scientology this generation. We ran in the court. We rooted out of schools and then we rooted out of public life. Everywhere it is seen is fallen. We educate everybody about it and we dig it up. And I think it's quite all right to isolate people who are practitioners of Scientology from our public life. Yeah, just, yeah. Just, just because of the dangers that a fanatic Scientologist has, they'll use your secrets. They'll expose your company secrets. You know, if you're having an IPO with your company and you have Scientologists there, that guy could be feeding that to Scientology, and Scientology could short sell your stuff. You know? Think about the ways in which a Scientologist will override all his respect for, for law and for justice and for, you know, fairness in favor of Scientology and how much information they have if they're looking for it, if they're in the government. Been, you know, placed somewhere in the long office. And I know I wouldn't think about it. I mean, I practically destroyed the world of my life with Bruce Turner because he was originally had a cult here and he was using dynamics to run his cult. And I was the trigger to send the lawyers in and I thought they made a change with them. Or they were shut down. So we have to keep our mind on how to listen to strangers and how to recognize it and some of the things. We help the victims to heal. We tear down its edifices and jail its leaders. And we melt down its fucking stainless steel plates. <laughs> yes.
Park, geared towards kids. And they had the uh, CCHR there handing out little bit. They were handing out the DVDs, Psychiatry and the Industry of Death. Um, I didn't want to call the scene. I had to be with my wife. And I knew if I went to confront them, <laughs> there would have been a scene. So I emailed the organizer of the event. And she said, I don't want to infringe on their free speech. How do I counter that? Okay, so I might here I'll just reiterate yeah. the question. I'm going to bring this to the question and then take it back to my other answer. So. Long, long story short, um, the CCHR is an event here in Margo, and they're handing out DVD psychiatrists.
you know, and maybe I'm Pollyanna about this, but I think it forms a kind of a bridge. As they go through their journey, other people follow them and listen to them because they were respected. And I, I hope, and maybe that again is, is a fantasy. I hope that someday they will, you know, fully exit and go, oh my God, from God, I live in so many people's lives. Forgive me. I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I think, in some ways, what Marnie's doing, sharing stories and things he knows with the lawyers in Texas and his wife in Texas. And the same thing with Render, talking to the FBI and all that. There is tempting, there is starting to make a difference. And that in itself is an apology. Yes. Okay, I, I have to phrase this. What are your thoughts about an ex that has given a lot of money, a lot of years, knows the history, the abuse, the con, the bullshit, and says that he would do it all over again? Right. Our friend, uh, our friend's talk yesterday. You know, first of all, I was listening to him. It seemed to make some sense to me. And I listened to some of the other people who were really taken aback and disgusted with it. And I have to agree with him. The thing that looking at it over that I noticed was he didn't have any empathy. He had what the psych, uh, psychiatrist called a flat half. He did not really have much emotional range as we speak. And I think that that's one of the hallmarks of the social network. Either adopted from Hubbard's personality or made escape. And, you know, he may believe what he's saying, but I think it's a slap on the face of all of us. No, that's what I'm. I'm. You know, I, I, I have to say that. And even though that was my initial reaction, I come out. And also, we want you to say something about Mr. Miscavige. I knew Mr. Miscavige briefly uh, when I was doing a mission for the Mission Operations Pathway, which was the renovations of the Cedar of Lebanon uh, Hospital. And I was on a project mission to do the exterior signs and the interior painting designs and color choices and stuff like that, along with two other missionaries uh, during that period. So I was connected with Mark Engler, who ran that mission, and Miscavige was part of the MLP mission. And he actually gave me my briefing when I fired out to that mission. And he was a small teenager. Um, but I thought, oh, what the hell? It was all sort of. Small teenager. The second time I really encountered Mr. Scavenge, I believe he had gone to La Quinta and had worked with Hubbard on making films. And in the meantime, the FBI raid had happened, in which I was running around the Scientology uh, complex buildings to the time I was hiding the handwritten LR, LRH dispatches about how we were designing his offices for what he was going to come out in the room. And uh, I was hiding this so that the FBI could get involved. So, somewhat later, the sketch came back, and. Uh, Can you do the mic? Somehow, somewhat later, the sketch came back and he had somehow gotten a position of authority. I'm um, not exactly sure how it happened, but he came in and gathered all us missionaries on project missions and he had us get the folders and take razor blades and slice every mention of Ron, every signature, anything that would show that Ron had any kind of control over Scientology or things that we were doing on this project mission. And I mean, you know, he approved the color choices for the original main job of that time. You know, he approved that new color. We sent the, sent the CSW to him and he approved it. You know, so we had the documents. We had, you know, I had an LRH accommodation for our whole mission, for our three missionaries, for what we've done in the country. And I was sitting there being told to slice his name out of these historic documents. Wow. You know, and I said, who the fuck is this, this strange teenager <laughs> to tell me that I get to destroy, that I have to destroy these these historical documents written by Ron in his own hand on this blue flimsy paper. Hmm, and I talked to Mark Ingram, who I knew was in charge of the mission. And Mark Ingram said, Yep, yes, they go ahead and do what he says. Wow. And 
You know, that was, that was spoilation of evidence. That was hiding evidence of the crime and the endearment of Ellen Hubbard and the organization of Scientology. What else? Do you speculate who, let's say, okay, in a perfect world, Miscavige would be in prison for the rest of his life, okay? Do you ever speculate who would succeed him? We, I mean, we've all gone on the internet, we've discussed it, but I, I haven't heard a name okay. bannered about. All right, I'll tell you what, from what I think, I don't know so, Can you repeat the question? Okay, so the, the question is basically who would succeed in this challenge if he goes down, he goes to prison, you know, who's going to run this edifice, this, you know, four or five million dollar edifice of the complex of Scientology? Well, one thing that happens is if he goes down and the IRS does their job, it's going to be seized. Is that right? Mean, if the IRS does their job and he gets sent to prison, all those assets are going to be seized by the IRS. And they may just disappear into the government because it will have been fraud from the get go. Yes. Thank you. 